As of April 14, 2014, the militants of the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Luhansk republics seized administrative buildings in all major cities of the Donbass region. Unlike during the annexation of Crimea, the Russian army did not directly participate in these events in the Donbass. Possessing significant supplies of small arms imported from the Russian Federation, the special services of Russia tried to form a local army. They appropriately named it the People's Militia of the Donbass. This is the fourth series of the film about the ATO, History of the War. We're trying to get to the bottom of the anti-terrorist operation in the east of Ukraine, its reasons and results. What does the Russian Federation have to do with all this? How does the confrontation between Ukraine and Russia pose a potential threat to Europe overall? In mid-April, Russian militants and armed Don Cossacks took over the public buildings of all major cities in the Donbass region. However, the epicenter of events was the Slavyansk Kramatorsk agglomeration, two cities with a total population of about 250,000 were merged like CME's twins. The local government did not put up any resistance. On the contrary, it facilitated the deployment and settlement of militants. Mayor of Slavyansk, Nelia Stepa, even claimed on television that these people are the Donetsk local defense, and she's personally acquainted with many of them. This is Donetsk militia, who today want to say that they are not only our militia, but also in Kramatorsk, Konstantinivka and Drushkivka. The fact that they had military-grade firearms, the same uniforms, as well as blatant Russian accent of the interventionists, was out of the spotlight. Later, it was confirmed that the absolute majority of these people were not citizens of Ukraine. On April 14, the Security Service of Ukraine published intercepted telephone conversations of the terrorists. It becomes clear from the transcript that the main backbone of the people who took over the public buildings in Slavyansk and Kramatorsk are members of Igor Gurkin's group. In the signature style of the Special Operations Forces, these people deployed in the Slavyansk Kramatorsk agglomeration began organizing the so-called militia, supplying it with weapons and ammunition. Retired colonel of the FSB, Gherkin, was also involved in the organization of separatist events that took place in Crimea. Subsequently, the colonel often states this in numerous television interviews he has given. In the spring of 2014, Gherkin worked under the pseudonym Strelkov and received instructions from the Russian administrator. He also reported on the results of his work to Serhii Aksyonov, the self-proclaimed chair of the Council of Ministers of Crimea. At the same time, Vladimir Putin categorically denies the very fact of the presence of any Russian troops or specialists in the Donbass region. Russian television, qualified professionals whose talents deserve better application, advanced technology, a picture of good quality, skillfully constructed programs for every taste. Until the winter of 2013, Ukrainians watched Russian TV channels en masse, some of which were available even in the cheapest cable television packages. In the year 2014, everything changed. By a strange coincidence, it was Russian journalists who were the first to appear at the scene of a number of various incidents, skirmishes and later terrorist attacks. They gave detailed reports of the events in Crimea and after that the pro-Russian rallies in the Donbass. At the same time, Ukrainian journalists were not allowed everywhere. Methods of physical brute force were often applied against them. Russian press sharks created the false impression that the entire population of Donbass wants to join Russia. The Russian mass media skillfully 
unlawfully manipulated the facts, stooping lower to disseminating blatant disinformation. At the very beginning of the confrontation, the Russian mass media won an unconditional victory in the informational war, which in the end made major problems in the war a reality. From the first day, barricades and armed patrols appeared on the streets of Slavyansk. The invaders began to import weapons to the city and indiscriminately distribute them among the local population, forming the so-called militia. Rumors were actively dispersed, stating that all these events were being held to protect residents from the mythical radicals and punishers. The Russian media created a terrible image of a bloodthirsty right-wing militant and exploited this to frighten the local people. Looking ahead, one fact should be noted. In April 2014, the horror-stricken population of the Slavyansk Kramatorsk agglomeration was expecting the appearance of buses with punishers, who allegedly were to commit mass murders and incite riots among the people. As of 2017, Slavyansk had long been under the control of the authorities, and the city's residents have returned to a peaceful life. And those mythical busloads of punishers that were allegedly supposed to appear in the city never did. The mass media of the Russian Federation skillfully manipulated words and terms. Internal troops of Ukraine, who were, in fact, militarized police forces, were assigned the task of ensuring public order and protecting strategically important state objects. Then, on March 13, 2014, these police forces were officially reorganized into the National Guard of Ukraine. It should be understood that from the very start only the name of these forces was changed. The personnel, tasks, structure and recruitment concepts have remained the same. Under the auspices of the National Guard of Ukraine, militia volunteer battalions began to appear. Russian mass media savored the new name in every possible way, often pronounced it in its abridged form. Nazgvardia trying to show it was consonant with the term Nazism. Just like in Crimea, Russian propaganda actively played on the fear factor exploiting the people's ignorance. No one thought about the difference between nationalism, Hitler's Nazism, and the fascism of Benito Mussolini. In April 2014, the threat of invasion was really tangible. The Russian army maneuvered in the immediate vicinity of the state border of Ukraine, and sometimes provocations were made, military equipment was deployed in battle order, and simulated the offensive, stopping or simply turning off at the very last moment. Similar actions took place not only on the eastern, but also on the northern border of Ukraine, only a few hours trip to the Ukrainian capital. Ukrainian troops were deployed along the entire northern border in the forests of the Chernihiv Oblast. Places were prepared to ambush enemy convoys on the route, Kiev Chernihiv, and trees along the road were cut down. Units of the army and the National Guard of Ukraine were mobilized to the eastern border of Ukraine in order to counter the likely invasion from Russia and participate in the anti terrorist operation. Airfields are a very important part of the infrastructure of any country. By analogy with small arms, capturing literally any aircraft, armored personnel carriers or even a faulty tank, the terrorists could legitimize the use of such weapons. Again, control of the airfield would ensure the prompt delivery of reinforcements and supplies from the Russian Federation by air. Realizing this, the Ukrainian command primarily sought to maintain control over the country's airfields and warehouses.
On April 15, the Special Forces of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the Security Service of Ukraine took control of the Kramatorsk airfield. Four militants were killed. After the battle, several hundred local residents with the flags of Russia and the Donetsk People's Republic gathered at the airfield. To drive the crowd away, the military shot into the air. On the same day, armed militants tried to occupy the airfield of Slovyansk, but were fended off and abandoned the idea. Legally, military-civilian relations were not regularized and that was the biggest problem. Formally, no martial law was introduced and any use of weapons and any incident involving the military were in the hands of the police. But the police, at best, maintained neutrality. On April 16, a convoy of equipment of the 25th Specialized Parachute Brigade was blocked in Kramatorsk. Local residents drove their cars out on the road and demanded that the soldiers disarm and also agitated them to defect to the Donetsk People's Republic. A hybrid war is fast, decisions need to be made quickly, and all responsibility falls on the shoulders of immediate commanders on the ground. Ukrainian legislation is imperfect and the military could not use force against unarmed people, despite the fact that they were behaving rather strangely. In some cases, they shot in the air or even threatened with grenades, but only at their own peril and risk. As a result, six units of blocked equipment, including one self-propelled mortar Nona, was captured by the people of Gherkin. The terrorists tried to convert about 50 soldiers and several of them defected to their side. The rest were released. This was a serious blow to the morale of the troops. The episode was widely covered by the Russian mass media with the main message. The soldiers of the Ukrainian army are a bunch of cowards and traitors, so resistance is useless. Though in reality, everything was quite different. We moved a lot. Night and day, we did combat reconnaissance near Slavyansk and in the surrounding settlements. The ADO headquarters says such tasks, and we had to travel a lot. We stumbled upon curses everywhere, stunts with automotive equipment, but the blocking was more symbolic. One, two or three machines tried to thwart the movement of our convoy. At the same time, they actively began blocking the 25th Brigade. After that, based on this experience, we began to prepare for such provocations. We developed different options of raising the blockade. In the event of blocking, the personnel dismounted from the armor and assumed tight formation. In front, they defended themselves with body armor, helmets, and automatic weapons were put forward. So that in case of shooting from the crowd, the fire could be returned. We borrowed flash grenades from internal troops and provided each officer and sergeant with such grenades. We armed ourselves with flare guns, small grenades and pushed the crowd aside so that the equipment could pass through. We trained in the base camp to prepare for such military actions. We created a flashbang effect in order not to harm the civilian population. At that time, this was set as a priority task, and from day to day we departed in ready form for such actions. On the same day in Mariupol, athletically well-built men wearing the same uniform appeared near the city council building. Video shooting was forbidden for the first time, strict pass control was introduced and blacklists of political undesirables posted. In the evening, an attempt was made to take over the local military unit. The attackers seized the checkpoint and moved into the territory shooting their way through. In response, shots were initially fired into the air, and then there was firing for the effect. As a result, the unit held on. Several attackers were killed and many were detained. Without slowing down the pace, on April 17, 2014, terrorists took over the television tower on Mount Karachun, near Slovyansk. 
instead of 1 plus 1 Russia 24, instead of Persi Nazionalny ORT, instead of STB Live News, on the fifth channel Russia 1. Thus, the people of the Slovyansk Kramatorsk agglomeration came under the full domination of Russian propaganda, if you will, Operation Mind Crime. On the same day, militants tried to take over the Stahanov city council in the Luhansk Oblast, but failed. The police reinforcements arrived from Luhansk and the assault was repelled. It should be emphasized that there was rampant robbery and looting along with sieges of public administrative buildings and the hoisting of new flags. Not everyone who got access to arms was obsessed with the ideas of the revolution and joining Russia. Criminal elements took advantage of the situation and the police simply did not have enough time or money to make efforts to fight them. Again, it is important to understand that these punishers can apply the fear factor only on average citizens who are poorly educated and prone to disinformation. The average business, however, was afraid of the so-called defenders of the people. At gunpoint, they abducted people in exchange for a ransom, confiscated their vehicles and stole all their valuables. This forced a part of the population to flee from the Donbass region. Many of these people fled for safety from the inflaming war to the den of Bandarides in western Ukraine, who were demonized by Russian television. On the same day, April 17, deputy of the Horlivka City Council, Volodymyr Rybak, was abducted right in front of television cameras. At the rally, he tried to remove the flag of the self-proclaimed DPR from the city council building and return the flag of Ukraine in its place. On April 22, the body of the deputy with traces of severe torture was found in the Kazeny Torets river in the vicinity of Slovyansk. It is known that evening he was taken to a meeting with Gherkin. Together with the body of Rybak, the body of student Yuri Popravka was found. He was also killed for his pro-Ukrainian position. On April 18, in the village of Serhivka near Slovyansk, Ukrainian security forces attacked and destroyed two checkpoints of militants. However, they did not hurry to get into the city. The Russian army experienced in the attack of the Chechen city of Grozny showed that an assault on a city can turn into a bloody massacre and is an extremely destructive operation. The battle in Grozny in 1995 resulted in more than 6,000 military and approximately 30,000 civilian casualties. The assault of Slovyansk covered by a specially trained Russian journalist could well be the reason the so-called Russian peacekeeping forces were sent there to ensure enforcement of peace. And if you call a spade a spade, the actual purpose of this mission was a full-scale invasion of Slovyansk. In an effort to avoid bloody assaults, the Ukrainian command relied on the encirclement of the separatists and cutting off their supply routes. The army and units of the National Guard of Ukraine began setting up checkpoints around Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. Throughout the country, police checkpoints appeared at the entrances to all of the major cities and oblasts in the country. On April 24, terrorists stormed army depots in the city of Bakhmut, the former Artemivsk, where tanks and other heavy equipment were stored. Around 50 people armed with lethal weapons attacked warehouses. Among the militants was Arseny Pavlov, later known by his call sign Motorola. However, the guard repelled the attack. Warehouses were surrounded for more than two months and the base was stormed a total of five times, albeit unsuccessfully. On April 30, Alexander Tuchinov admitted that the situation in the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts is not controlled by Ukraine. The Russian mass media broadcasting this statement fantasized that the anti-terrorist operation had completely failed. However, the Russo-Ukrainian war was just picking up steam.